right. Hey, everybody. How are you? My name is Dean. I'm the producer here at The Block, and we've got a really exciting webinar for you guys today with kind of everything that's been going on in the industry. Uh, we're bringing you this piece called How to Strengthen and Invest in Your Team in Crypto Winter, brought to you by our sponsor for us all. So as we know, you know, the crypto industry has grown pretty massively over the past decade, and it's really accelerated with uh, the bull market. And through 2017, up until now, there's been so much growth in the industry. There's been so much happening. There's a wide range of growing crypto incumbents, as well as new players entering the industry, looking to attract awesome new talent. And, you know, with the changes in the market, with the slowdown here, it's still an exciting time in the hiring space. And so we brought on a crack team of panelists here for you to chat a little bit about their different vantage points and, you know, kind of what they're observing in the industry. And each of them are going to bring a couple interesting, contrasting viewpoints of what they've been seeing. So we're going to toss it over to them to just do a light introduction of themselves and we'll get started from there. So, um, Rob, I think we'll get started with you. If you want to introduce yourself, we'll move on to David and Brittany. Sure. Uh, my name is Rob Payon. I'm the founder of Proof of Talent. We are a recruiting firm that works exclusively with companies in the blockchain, cryptocurrency, Web3 industry. Um, work with about 30 different companies throughout the space. Um, so, yeah, excited to, to chat about hiring and recruiting today. Great. David? Oh, oh can't, I think can't you might muted. Muted. <laughs> There we go. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm David Ramirez, co-founder and chief investment officer of uh, For Us All. And um, we pr we're a 401k provider uh, that is unique in that we also uh, provide uh, employees the ability to invest their 401k directly into crypto. Uh, so we work with a lot of uh, blockchain crypto companies in the space. Great. Thank you. Brittany? Hi, everyone. I am Brittany. I am the VP of People here at The Block. Um, I oversee the talent and recruiting and employee engagement um, aspects of the people function. We are a um, information services um, blockchain company and uh, have been going through hyper growth mode since I joined the company about 10 months ago. I love that hyper growth mode is a great description <laughs> for a lot of what's been going on in the industry. So, you know, we'll get started here. And I think let's talk about what's kind of top of mind for a lot of those hiring in the industry right now, right? Um, there's been a shift in the broader market, uh, macro as well as crypto. We are now in a bear market to whatever degree, um, wherever we may be in that point. But has this changed your approaches to how you guys do hiring, to how you pitch, how you guys speak to those in the industry or maybe those coming into it? For the very first time so i think rob we'll, we'll start with you on that and we'll move over again to david and Brittany. sure um I, I think there certainly has been a bit of a shift in terms of i think really like the entire landscape you have the types of companies that are hiring there's been some companies that have been pulling back some companies who have either maintained and even in some cases accelerated hiring uh, but i think also when you're looking at the quote unquote pitch to new candidates, depending upon their familiarity with the industry and, and their comfort level, I think that there is more of a conversation that kind of needs to, to happen now or, or just some easing of the mind as far as this is what you're stepping into and, and kind of telling people, hey, this industry is not going away this just because certain things have happened. Um, so I think that is a conversation that we could probably get into more on like the exact nature of that. But I think that's probably the biggest thing is it's gone from six months ago, a year ago being, this is the hot, sexy new industry that everybody wants to be a part of. And now I think some people are questioning whether that not that is actually the case because of what has happened in terms of prices of the assets, but also the layoffs that have happened in some of the larger companies over the past month, two months. Yeah, that's a good point. There's definitely been a little bit of a slowdown or a pushback from some of those players in the industry that grew very fast. But David, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, so we're certainly seeing three big trends. Um, the first to echo Rob, uh, a lot of companies that were are reevaluating what their, not only their overall uh, headcount growth targets for the year, some deciding to 
pause on a lot of the new hires that they were intending to make um, to get ahead of the growth that they expected. Um, but we're also seeing people taking a step back, looking at the processes that they were using when they were evaluating candidates. Um, look, if you're hiring right now in the environment, uh, it's, it's better. You, you have more potential candidates. The competition is less, which allows you to be pickier. Uh, and I think a lot of really strong companies are evaluating how they were um, assessing who they wanted to bring on the team and raising the bar. Um, I think the last trend that we're beginning to see is companies taking a step back and recognizing that a lot of employees are anxious, uncertain, and maybe a little bit afraid of not just the overall ecosystem, but potentially the viability of, uh, of the company or project that they've just joined. Uh, in that case, we're seeing leading HR professionals um, taking a look at their benefits offerings and seeing, looking for opportunities to show stability and continued commitment to the team uh, through benefits that don't actually break the bank. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Um, the viability in the company and the stability of the company is a really interesting point. But Brittany, we'll, we'll turn it over to you because you sit from a very little bit of a, uh, a different perspective here um, in terms of how you go about hiring. So could you talk to us a little bit about how it looks on the inside? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I'll echo everything that Rob and David said. I think those are, um, I think everybody that is trying to recruit in this market are seeing those things. Um, the thing that I will add, and this, this is kind of um, additive to, to the actual question, Dean, but, you know, I think as a first step in this environment, companies have to be honest with their employees. They need to provide a really clear message on that everybody in the company has access to on like, this is the market we're in. This is how it's impacting our company. And this is how we're reacting. Because ultimately, candidates are smart, and those that's the information that they're looking for during the recruiting process as they're evaluating potential opportunities. So if you can communicate that to your employee base, your recruiters are really clear on what that message is, and they can recruit that to potential hires, um, I think your close rate is going to be much higher. And I think we also have to get ahead of that in the recruiting process. You know, we, we were just having some conversations around this internally yesterday of, what are we doing to make sure that we're understanding what potential candidates' um, concerns are well before we get to the late stages of the process so that we're able to address them during the process? Because there are responses to those things um, and to those concerns that we're seeing, but um, we need to be strategic about when we're responding to those and how comfortable we're making candidates or um, uh, when we're kind of giving them that information throughout the process as well. Yeah. Before we dive into some of those candidate concerns, um, well, I think let's just look at the broader market, right, and how that's playing into crypto recruiting. So when you guys tackle growth and hiring in an industry, especially one like this, that's, that's prone to a lot of market volatility, right? Um, how does this impact growth from like maybe the entry level to maybe some of these more C-suite hires, right? What kind of candidate concerns are you guys seeing? Um, we'll, we'll spin it over to David this time. Yeah, so, um, you, you know, I think it uh, a lot of it really depends on where they're coming from and how much of a background they have in uh, crypto and blockchain. I, I think for us, it's really critical that we're, we're looking for folks that not only have, we're a 401k business, right? So we need people who actually understand are experts in 401ks, traditional financial assets, but they need to not only have an interest in, uh, in cryptocurrency, they have to have a passion for it. <clears throat> So when we are doing a good job selecting in the recruiting funnel, those employees that really understand blockchain, they get it, they see uh, how transformative the technology could potentially be, um, then it's less of an issue of the downturn. People understand markets go up, markets go down. Uh, crypto might do so to a greater extent than other asset classes. Um, and the last thing we do uh, is really just pull back a little bit and focus on the big picture. Crypto prices do not necessarily reflect crypto adoption. Uh, when you look across the industry, and for me, the, the most bullish signs are things like uh, large arms, uh, large uh, companies like Lockheed Martin uh, beginning to use blockchain technology in, to encrypt satellite communications in supply chain management. When you begin to see big players leveraging the power of blockchain in real world applications, that's what people at least the people that we talk to need to see in order to keep the faith uh, that, yeah, markets might be pulling back, prices might be down, um, but that there is a, uh, we're on a long-term trajectory of, of uh, adoption. We're just beginning to see those applications come to market. Rob? 
Yeah, I would say that the kind of the volati volatility of the industry is difficult in a lot of respects from a hiring standpoint. Um, and I, I think you've seen it with the larger companies like a Coinbase, uh, where they were at 1,200 employees in 2021 and grew all the way up to 5,000 employees. And that's that's wild growth. And they just had the large layoff of 1,000 you know, plus people at plus rescinding, I think, about 500 uh, job uh, job offers to to candidates as well. And I, I think when you look at that, you can kind of see the challenges that are presented because you have these huge periods of growth in core businesses where you're increasing revenue, all that type of stuff. You're looking for that headcount to handle that type of, of growth. But I think we've seen time and time again, and that's also important to kind of in the back of your mind, realize that times aren't always going to be perfect and that there is a significant chance, no matter how good you are at building a company, that you could see you know, 50% of your users all of a sudden gone in, in the course of three months. And I think we saw that 2017, 2018, and we're seeing that again now. And I think some companies have done a better job of maybe anticipating that pullback and, and realizing that those good times don't always last forever, um, or just kind of having that slowly more scaled growth than the rapid hiring that some of the larger companies have, have done. Um, so I think that's just one of the big challenges is kind of accounting for that volatility. Um, really hiring across the board, I think. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. The um, scale growth versus some of the rapid hiring that we see during different market changes. But um, Brittany, what's what's your perspective on this? Yeah, so I think there are a couple, the entry level to C-suite hires question is, is an interesting one because I do think we are doing different levels of education depending on the experience that candidates are coming in with. And I think that depends on both how long they've been in the professional space, um, as well as how much exposure they've had to crypto. So, you know, we were we have people at, in our company today. We have people that we're recruiting today that have never been in a um, in the market when we've seen the market do this. So, we've had to actually do some broader market um, uh, education to the the current team, to people that are coming in that are asking questions about you know the longevity of of crypto. And so, that's been kind of interesting. And I think we're leaning into it a little bit more market specific with the more junior um, hires and then um, and, and then more of like the how crypto has actually played out for senior hires. I think also on the senior side, um, I, I we're still getting a lot of people who have been in crypto for a while, also people who are new to crypto applying for these types of jobs. And, and we're really looking for people who are motivated by this this shift in the market. I know that that seems kind of crazy to say, but they're, we're looking for people who want to solve this problem, who want to work through um, these challenges and who have you know seen them before and seen companies come out on the other end of them better, stronger than they were before. And um, so we're still speaking to a lot of people that are um, that are looking for that kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that, 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 that's interesting. I, uh, it, I know a number of our clients, um, do, token grants are an increasingly important part uh, of their overall uh, comp packages to employees. Um, certainly for those folks that may have gotten a token grant maybe a year ago or 18 months ago, um, they're not worth what they once were. Um, however, for the prospective employees that are coming now, I mean, it, to a certain extent, if you do believe that in cryptocurrency blockchain, the project that you're working for, the fact that crypto markets are depressed right now is actually makes those token grants even more valuable potentially in the future. That's interesting. Yeah, we could talk a little bit about those kinds of incentives that um, hiring managers look to give new hires and uh, you know new potential employees coming onto the company. But I think for for those that have been impacted uh, by some of these, you know, maybe maybe recent layoffs and are maybe like looking to really find a hiring manager who's going to help them figure out the right way to make a stake in this industry. Uh, to be able to find the right opportunity for themselves because they still, you know, believe in this in a lot of ways or are seeing some of the growth, right, that's been going on or have observed it maybe during the, the bull run of the market. Um, what, do you, what are you guys uh, seeing in terms of that, right? Um, how are you guys communicating to some of those folks um, who, you know, maybe a little bit on the fence, but really do kind of believe in this space? I guess, Brittany, let's, let's start with you again on that and we'll go over to Rob. Yeah, so I, I would say for anybody who's, been impacted and are wanting to stay in the space. I, 
you know, we've all said this already in these first few minutes of this webinar, but crypto is, isn't dead. Like we're in this, we're in a down part of a cycle. Um, again, there will be companies that prevail from this. So I would say not to give up on the space, but to be a little bit more thoughtful about evaluating the business model um, for the companies that you're interviewing for. I think if you ask the right questions, you can make an informed decision and feel really confident in, um, in that decision for yourself. Um, you know, and I think I think one of the things that you can look at is not not necessarily like has this company had to do layoffs. I don't think I, I think that that is a, nat a natural part of this cycle. But how did they handle it? Um, and and how far in advance um, were they planning for this type of thing? I think that that can give you a lot of indicators for the trajectory of a company and how quickly they're able to bounce back and what your impact is going to be able to be there. Because I think a lot of times understanding how the internal company runs is will, will give you an indicator of how impactful and successful you'll be able to be in that role. But companies should have a answer for those things. They should be really clear on this is how we responded. This is why we responded the way that we are. And this is the outcome that we anticipate to see from that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Rob, we'll turn that same question over to you. So how are you speaking with folks that might have been more impacted by this market, but are, are still seeing some some bright spots and, and want to know the right direction for themselves? And you sit in an interesting vantage, too, where you're working predominantly with crypto focused companies within the industry itself. Yeah. So I would say that obviously it's incredibly unfortunate for anybody that was impacted by the layoffs. Um, a couple of different, I think, positive spins in terms of the future candidacy having previous crypto experience i think is a massive leg up against other candidates so i think one of the toughest parts about finding a job in crypto is really getting that foot in the door and so if you already have that foot in the door um i think that's that's a huge hugely positive thing and, and second of all what we found is most companies are really pretty much every company um nobody's holding layoffs against candidates or anything like that and looking at somebody impacted by a layoff as, as some type of like negative thing or um, in, in kind of any, any, I guess, negative lens like that. So I would say those are kind of two positive things. Uh, and, and going off what, what Brittany said, I think it's really important to try and look back and reflect on, on where you were and, and think about like what that ideal next step in your career is. Now that you had that experience within the industry, what did you like about the previous company, be it, manager business model a kind of subsector of the industry um and try and really own in on on what you want to do next and and go after that i think that's that's in some cases like the the best kind of next step to do is really think about where you were um and, and where you want to be and, and use this as an opportunity to to kind of reset and, and find that ideal next step of of your career i think that's a great point david yeah, so <clears throat> I'll think about that in two parts. First, um, you know, the companies that engage in layoffs are, in fact, also impacted to a certain degree, especially as they look to continue to retain and, uh, the employees that they did keep, <clears throat> as well as grow. Um, but for the employees that were uh, impacted by a layoff, um, if, if they still have the faith, uh, the belief that blockchain crypto is going to continue in a long term tr positive trajectory, um, then the fact that they were laid off um, and are continuing to look for jobs uh, in the blockchain industry uh, shows that they actually have commitment and vision. Uh, and in an early stage tech company, that is the most important thing. It is a slog. You, you, we all know this day in, day out, uh, two steps forward, sometimes three steps back. Um, so you need to have grit and perseverance. Um, you know, your past crypto role shows that you have experience. Your continued interest in the space despite a layoff uh, uh, shows really commitment and, and grit uh, to the core vision. Um, so from my perspective, when we're looking at somebody who was unfortunately impacted by a layoff and if they're still in it, they still have that, they're still holding the flame. Uh, that to me is a, a really positive sign um, uh, that, that speaks well of the employee. But for the company though, <clears throat> when you do engage in a layoff, then there's always the concern for prospective employees or even the current employees about the stability of the organization. Um, you know, this is not my first significant uh, downturn. I was, I was managing uh, at, uh, billions of 401k assets during the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis for a fintech firm. Um, you know, there, what we did was very early on in the, down market, in the downturn, uh, we had to cut back our, our team. 
Uh, we did not know how long the uh, downturn was going to persist. Um, and so we felt it was prudent to make sure that we could be there for our clients to make early cuts. And you see that that is a tried and true stat stru strategy for a lot of tech companies during market downturns. Um, so if I'm talking to a team uh, or prospective employees after having done a layoff, I would really point that point to the layoff as evidence of the maturity, stability of the organization. We saw that we were entering a new environment. We wanted to make sure that we were there to continue serving our clients. And so we acted quickly. Uh, so I would, I would position that as a strength of the organization going forward, not at all a sign of weakness. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I just so. agree with that, David. Like, I, um, companies are being smart about what they're doing now, and mm -hmm. that's what the the team that stays and and, and people that you're recruiting want to understand that. And so, companies just need to be really ready to be transparent about how they made decisions and why they made decisions. Um, and I think the um, the respect will will come. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything there, Rob? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that was mostly as, as far as like the, the layoffs go or how I think that was pretty much I, how I would answer everything or so nothing really yeah. on top of that. Well, let's, let's spin you, um, a little bit of a twist on, on that same kind of question. Right. So when, so versus, you know, speaking with the actual, you know, potential new hires, um, when you're talking with companies, how are they navigating this economic climate and, and how does that filter into conversations with new potential hires? Brittany talked a little bit about this, right? When we're kind of onboarding through either uh, employees on an entry level versus uh, some of the C-suite side, but what you're hearing from companies uh, within the industry, um, I'm very curious. And then we'll move over to David, what he's hearing from kind of ancillary companies developing some form of blockchain, either department or technology within their uh, larger corporation? Yeah, so I would say that there's there's almost like probably two to three different buckets right now of, of companies. You have one bucket that either overexpanded or is just very much getting conservative and, and has conducted yeah. layoffs, slowed down hiring basically completely. You have another one that's kind of um, basically business as usual at this point in time, slow, efficient hiring. And then there's I would say even a, a third bucket at this point in time of, of companies that maybe were, were a little bit more conservative previously and, and have the, the runway to, to be aggressive at this point in time and are, are looking to be more aggressive in terms of their hiring and, and taking this as somewhat of an opportunity. And I think really we've had that kind of conversation with a lot of different companies that we work with that are still hiring is this now is an opportunity for us to to hire talent that we likely wouldn't have had an opportunity to hire otherwise be it layoffs or like large companies that have been aggressive in terms of compensation or opportunity that simply aren't hiring anymore these candidates are going to go somewhere people want to work in the crypto industry whether you know whether or not you believe that they they certainly do and somebody is they're going to land somewhere and it's a matter of of finding that talent and and being of aggressive with the opportunity when it presents itself. So we, we definitely have seen some companies just taking this as, as the, as the opportunity to, to find that talent that they wouldn't have gotten else. Yeah. So they're a little more picky with their, with their talent maybe these days. David. Yeah. So I think a lot of what we're seeing, I'm certainly echoing Rob. Uh, it, it, this is really is a chance um, to reevaluate the processes that were used to hire folks in the past. Um, and because of the over, because of the overall market, it, it allows people to be a lot pickier uh, with who they're bringing onto the team. Um, in terms of positioning the roles, what, what we're seeing is actually similar to what we've seen in past tech uh, downturns, uh, pre-crypto, uh, which is uh, tech companies looking to de-risk the, the, the perception of joining an earlier stage tech company. Uh, in the past, a lot of that was uh, companies, whether it was a seed Seed, seed funded company or even a series A might have in, rolled out benefits like a 401k plan sooner than they otherwise would have. Some even provided a company match sooner than they otherwise would have. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, look, for, for somebody who is joining an early stage tech company, you don't totally have the belief in the vision and what the, that the company can solve the problem that they created themselves to solve. Um, however, it's, whether it's your parents, whether it's your uh, partner, 
uh, or your friends, inevitably people are going to be asking, well, what if it doesn't work? And there needs to be a good answer. I think when you do, when people do add benefits like a 401k plan that allow people to continue to make progress on these long-term financial goals, irrespective of uh, how the uh, stock option grant or the token grant ultimately perform, that makes it a lot safer for people to take that leap, go from the Google to the earlier stage project, um, because they'll have the confidence that they're going to be able to continue making progress regardless of uh, whether or not the company ends up being um, a, a huge win. Um, and so we're seeing companies really take an opportunity and, and look at how can we de-risk it through benefits um, and then coming back to it, like focusing on uh, the stability, maturity of the overall leadership team, that this is not their first rodeo, uh, that they understood uh, the signs on the wall, reacted quickly uh, and have a stable balance sheet in order to weather the storm because this could last a long time. Um, the opportunity is not going to fade, uh, but the company needs to be able to survive. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. Brittany, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely seeing in this market um, people who we <clears throat> used to be able to sell solely on the impact. You know, we, we recruit a lot out of like big, well-known companies and the big sell there was you're going to be able to do so much more here. Like, you know, that project that you're one of 15 on, you're going to be one of two on. Imagine the impact that you're going to have. Um, and and I think for for most people leaving in a uh, more, you know, founded company that's been around for a really long time that has a ton of resources, um, for a long time, that was enough. People wanted, um, people wanted that impact and they were kind of like willing to take the risk in order to get it in their career. Not always, but, um, but most of the time. Um, and now we are having to be a little bit more strategic around, you know, we, um, we're a company that offers stock options. We've had to be really clear about what those stock options mean. Um, we've been pretty transparent with um, how we calculate potential return on those, which is something that I haven't had the opportunity to do in previous companies. It's just been a very like, you know, here's a number. We can't tell you what it means, but trust us. Um, and I don't think that that plays anymore. So I know there's a lot of different ways that people are trying to get creative on benefits and comp and things like that. Um, and, I, and I do think we're we're leaning into more of our other benefits about things, you know, to David's point, our 401k match and really trying to showcase a more mature organization than we've had to in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that's especially when we're. Um thinking about stock option grants versus token grants, I think that that's another benefit that a lot of uh, earlier stage crypto projects can can highlight. You know, stock option grants, who knows when you're going to have a liquidity event. Obviously, with the token grant, there's significantly more liquidity. Uh, with stock options, um, maybe you get one or two valuations a year. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what you're granted may be materially different than what the actual uh, uh, fair valuation is in a down market that works against you. Um, mm -hmm. However, the extent to which a, a project is actually uh, re-indexing their token grants to reflect the current market value of those token grants, um, that's a huge win for folks that are joining a, a blockchain project. Um, and the liquidity, uh, again, is a huge win, allowing people to uh, benefit uh, if, w w if and when uh, markets uh, uh, recover. Yeah. And just to add on to that, I think especially in the crypto space today, a, a lot of people are looking for that liquidity and they want that in in kind of their back pocket of back pocket of being able to have some sort of liquidity event. So we have actually seen I've seen a pretty big shift in how um, crypto companies are are structuring their equity programs to create earlier liquidity than, um, you know, just having to hold on to it until something happens. Um, so that's been that's been something that I haven't seen before that I've seen a lot in the last few months. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think we kind of covered a little bit of the next question I'm going to ask um, with some of the comments that were here, but we'll dive into a little bit more. So we, we talked a little bit about, you know, how companies can position themselves um, with new hires, but um, specifically, how can they take advantage of hiring opportunities like during the bear market? So David and Brittany covered a little bit about this, right? Talking about some of the changes in making sure that long-term financial goals are aligned, uh, de-risking, right? And also, you know, this mix of maybe equity, token options, and other kinds of add-ons to entice um, new employees. But maybe we'll start with Rob here on this one. How, how can companies position themselves to be taking advantage of these higher opportunities in this environment right now? Yeah, I think the the earlier comment about risk is is interesting because 
I think that's something that, especially over the past few months, has kind of flipped on. Has the, I think the concept of, of r- career risk is, has a little bit been flipped on its head because there have been what I would traditionally consider some of the safer companies and opportunities within the crypto space that have you know, conducted large layoffs and, and had you know, negative things for, for employees happen, uh, whether it's down rounds or anything like that. And then you've had these smaller companies that were perceived to be very risky uh, not have those those kind of negative uh, externalities. Uh, so with that said, I think that if you are a smaller organization or a, you know lesser known organization and you're trying to hire and you're coming up against those those types of of objections or just challenges when it comes to hiring people, I think that that's something you can lean into a little bit uh, more as far as 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 risk goes and and kind of t- just have have an honest conversation with the the people that you're you're looking to bring on and i think kind of going back to, to what Brittany said too i think just being honest and transparent in terms of what you're doing gives you a, a significant leg up against a lot of companies that are hiring in the space and just in general quite frankly like even something as, as simple that you just mentioned as really like going over what the the financial kind of models of your your either your equity or token compensation or whatever it is there's there's a lot of companies that will simply say oh we're going to give you some equity or oh we're going to give you some tokens mm-hmm. um and if you're a candidate and you have two different opportunities and one company is telling you this is exactly what your equity is worth and what it needs to be worth to be worth xyz and then you have another company that's just saying hey you know we might give you some equity maybe you'll have a you know you'll you'll have a doc later on that transparency is is like that type of that type of thing is, is really important. And I guess it kind of, to me, in a lot of cases, it really just boils down to like being managing the people on your team and hiring the people on your team in a way that if you were a candidate that you would want to go through that process. Um, and I think if you kind of do those types of things, that'll put you up, put you in a significant leg up over a lot of the companies in the hiring space. And it's a little bit unrelated, but I think obviously the the, the crypto space is immature in the fact that it's only been around for, let's say 12, 12 years in total from Bitcoin, but also really say like eight years professionally, there's still a lot of immaturity in the hiring space in, in crypto. So if you approach things in a, in a professional manner, typically it, it does it does pretty well in comparison to some of the other you know people that you're competing against in terms of hiring. Yeah, Brittany, can we get your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, I agree with all of that. I think there's also the the kind of other part of this is there are companies who... There are companies who are still hiring. Um, we talked about how there's great talent in the market, unlike anything that we've seen before, um, or at least in recent years. You know, I um, when I joined, we were in an employees market, and now we're moving a little bit more towards an employers market, which, as we've all kind of said, has allowed us to slow down um, and really think about who we want um, in a way that we haven't had the luxury of doing before. Um, but I also think there are companies, a lot of most companies I would say we're seeing right now are either not hiring or are hiring much more slowly. So have pulled back and are being a little bit more strategic about who they're bringing on when and what the, the remit of those roles are going to be. Um, and I think a lot of times that becomes a recruiting team missed opportunity because mm. there's so much that you can be doing in these slower recruiting pushes. Um, and, and I think, uh, David alluded to this a little bit earlier, but there's, you know, you've now, most of us have now brought on a significant number of people in a very short period of time over the course of the last call it year. Um, so this is a really good time to slow down and reflect on what your recruiting process is, um, where we may have made mistakes, where it could be better. And if you are, are capitalizing on this time and you're making those adjustments, then, um, then I think you're going to come out as a much in a much better position because hiring will pick back up. And the worst case scenario is you didn't use this time to better your hiring process, and then you'll still be making some of the hiring mistakes that you were making over the course of the last year. So I, I feel just very strongly that this is um, there's a lot of opportunity here, even if it's not opportu- recruiting opportunity in the way that we think of it in terms of like bringing on X number of people in this short period of time. David? Yeah, um, definitely echo, echo Brittany. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think when I'm, if, if I were uh, going out and, and recruiting an employee uh, as, a, as a, either people leader or executive, um, I think the first thing is obviously to de-risk. We talked about that uh, 
The second is really to thoughtfully uh, articulate, understand what type of risk you actually have. Uh, there's a broad spectrum of companies. You, you have on one end of the spectrum, you might have uh, a crypto exchange um, where the value or revenues of that, of that project are highly dependent on um, price growth, right? When price growth is not there, uh, things are flat. When price is greater, revenue is greater. Um, so that you have a profound amount of price risk in your overall financial model. On the other end of the spectrum, you have folks like the block, um, CoinList, uh, uh, or uh, CoinDesk, or maybe it's on-chain anal on analytic firms, where it's really more ecosystem growth that's driving the long-term and even potentially the, the short-term financial results. In those businesses, you may, well, uh, what, what is the key driver of, of the business is the continued expansion of the ecosystem, the continued interest in the ecosystem. And so they may be uh, rather immune from some of the pullback in the crypto prices. Uh, understanding where you fall on that spectrum and being able to articulate that clearly can help those that are really not that impacted by price risk and it's more around ecosystem growth and then telling the story as to why we believe that, that, that the ecosystem is uh, going to continue to grow, whether it's looking at, well, who's, who are the top recruiters of blockchain talent right now? I think um, at the first eight out of the nine, they're non-crypto companies. You're mm -hmm. talking about Accenture, Deloitte & Touche, Johnson & Johnson, Ericsson Mobile. Um, these companies are actually applying rap, uh, uh, rapidly hiring blockchain talent because they want to apply the power of the blockchain, uh, whether it's uh, supply chain management, communications, uh, what have you. Uh, and so being able to tell that, put yourself on that spectrum, am I over here with uh, where my revenues are a function of price growth, or I'm over here where it's ecosystem growth? If you're over here, you're sitting pretty, you just need to be able to articulate that story as to why one should continue to believe that the ecosystem is going to continue to grow because of the profound potential impact it can have uh, on, on, on how we solve problems. Yeah, and yeah. just to kind of reiterate, I feel like... W we can't overlook doing that. I know, I know we're talking a lot about recruiting, but we're doing that for new hires. But I think it's so important that you're doing that internally, too, and educating your teams um, on where what your business model is, where you sit, where you're impacted. And I know I said a little bit of that earlier, but how horrible would it be if you missed the opportunity to communicate that message internally to your teams, but they heard that message from someone externally and decided to leave as a result of that? So I feel like we're spending a lot, most recruiting teams that I know of in the crypto space right now are spending a lot of time figuring out what that message is for candidates. And so mm. if you're already doing that work, then sharing that internally is really important too. And that, look, those people are interviewing your candidates too. So you want them to have the same, you know, message and understanding of where the company's going and, and why this is the right, right, um, right move for somebody as, um, as the rest of the recruiting team. Yeah, I, I think that you kind of have to look if, if this is something where you've been through these cycles in the past, then it probably doesn't bother you as much. But I think you also need to like take a step back and put yourselves in the shoes of somebody on your team who, who hasn't been in that situation and see just kind of how rattling that might be. Like last, I, last week, we had a conversation internally where there's a lot of recruiters on my team now who are not around in 2018, 2019, 20, and even 2020. Uh, and who joined in the last year, year and a half. And if you open up Bloomberg, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, any major uh, you know media outlet right now, and you see Bitcoin hitting all time lows, um, you know layoffs at Coinbase, layoffs here, um, prices cratering, all all this type of stuff, you you might be sitting in your seat and saying like, why am I working here? And and what's going on? Is this industry even going to be around anymore? And that's that's internally. That's not even externally as far as bringing that. Um, bringing that talent inside. So I think you also want to, like you said, you want to look internally and just have a conversation with people. And that's what we did. We just essentially looked at the headlines and then I went back and painted some things in historical context and said, this has happened in 2013. It happened in 2017 and 2018. Mm -hmm. It's happening again now. Um, do I know if it's going to immediately go back up? I have no idea. Probably not. Is it going to go back up again at, at some point in the future? I sure hope so. Cause I'm betting my career on it, but <laughs> Um, you know, this, this stuff has happened before and it's okay to be uncomfortable by it, but this isn't the first time and it probably isn't going to be the last time either. But, yeah. but I, I think it, and maybe one, 
thing to point out when you're having that conversation is this time it is different. It fun mm. definitely is different. And for me, the reasons why it's different, um, look, there are a lot of long-term bullish things that are happening in the ecosystem that weren't in prior downturns. We have uh, le potential legislation uh, that's going to clear up a lot of the uncertainty around whether or not something's a security or a commodity, whether it's the Loomis bill or others. Um, so we have very positive trends on the regulatory environment, even going back to the Biden executive order, right, which basically recognized that blockchain has the potential to be transformative, that it's a national imperative for us to continue to be to foster that innovation so that we could continue to be a global leader in tech. And, and of course, also focusing on that the, the financial benefits of innovation should be um, uh, 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 available to all. So we've got positive regulatory signs. Uh, I, I keep coming back to the number of large companies that are actually now building real world applications. That is not slowing down. If anything, the expectation uh, of many is that it's going to accelerate. Um, and these were positive long-term bullish things that did not really exist uh, to the extent that they do now in prior downturns. Um, so it's focusing on those positives. And then also, what does it mean for you and your organization? Um, this is not just simply about uh, maintaining an organization that's stable so that you survive a downturn. It's really uh, continuing to invest in the people, in the product, so that you continue to be uh, 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 move forward um, and so that you're really set up for strength uh, when, when the market ultimately recovers. So it's about focusing not just on what the problems you've solved in the past, but what are the problems that you're solving in the future? For us, as an example, uh, look, we're a 401k platform. 401ks historically have probably been one of the least sexy benefits uh, that uh, an employee could possibly get, particularly in the crypto ecosystem. Great. So we expanded our platform to be able to allow people to invest their 401k in crypto. That's fantastic. But what does that actually mean for us as we're talking long-term vision? It's, guys, we built a platform that allows people to buy and sell digital assets in a 401k. That's cool. What does the future look like? It's a future uh, potentially holds the, not, not just the ability to stake, uh, but the ability to mine cryptocurrency potentially within your 401k. The ability to provide access to venture capital, private equity on chain, expanding the scope. Looking even further, um, the ability to do really unique things with the 401k by moving all of the traditional assets on chain. That's what the future is. When we talk to somebody in the 401k industry and you describe to them the future state where all the, the entire 401k is on chain, they immediately begin to understand, oh my gosh, that we're going to go from a world where it takes 14 days for somebody to get money out of their 401k to where that could be conducted in minutes. And it's really showing that you're going to continue to make progress in those long-term goals and the potential impact it could have in your space. Yeah, I think that's a really great point too, because looking at kind of how this has changed to be able to offer more sort of legitimate rails um, in, in that way to new employees or to current employees who are looking to uh, maybe, you know, have either more of a stake directly with maybe their 401k in crypto as some way of having exposure um, is very, very interesting. And just a sign of how far this, this industry has kind of come with even in the last few years. Um, Brittany, did you want to add anything kind of to that as well? Um, you know, the only thing I'll add is that we can't be, we can't assume that people know these things. Um, and I think a yeah. lot of times the people who are in organizations that are creating this message um, know what they know and don't think to think about what the most junior, most entry level crypto person knows. Um, so, so I would just say um, when you're, when you're thinking about how you're explaining your company and where you're going and what the opportunity is, um, we recognize that I know every crypto company has had to hire people who don't have crypto knowledge. Um, at the block, we've we've done a lot, I, I would say, for the size of our company and trying to get people up to speed on crypto. Um, but one of the things that we realized during this downturn is we haven't done a lot of history of the volatility of the market. Yeah. Um, and so so you you just have to understand that there's there's quite a bit of education here for people, um, even if there's not that education required for you. Got it. I think that's um, that's a good transition into our next question. We're going to source a couple of questions from our audience in a couple of minutes, but um, let me just dovetail this into 
a little bit of a, of a right turn here. So broadly, companies are becoming remote first, right? This is a uh, going out of pandemic world, um, hopefully. Um, so a lot of these growing companies are looking to create a healthier company culture that's composed of a lot of these remote teams, right? So how do you go about helping institutions, helping companies maybe organize some of that remote work structure? Or how do you deal with that internally when you're organizing teams that have to work cross collaboratively with maybe teams that are operating in five different continents, you know, all over the world and need to work um, interoperably. So um, I think, uh, David, we'll, we'll start with you on there. We'll move to, to Rob. Yeah, so, so I think it uh, comes down to uh, both the people and the way you communicate need to change. Uh, so uh, back when we were all in the office, um, uh, it, pe people handle remote work versus office work very differently. Um, some folks are entirely uh, self-driven. Um, it doesn't matter if they're in the office, on the train, um, uh, watching a child soccer. They just cannot turn off. Turn off. They're constantly thinking about the problems that they're solving. They're super engaged. They're excited. They've got this unending flow uh, and passion for what they're doing. Um, they can work anywhere. It does not matter, office or at home. They're always on thinking, excited to solve the problems that they've been uh, given. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you, you have, fo th there may be some folks that think of it more as a job. I'm coming, doing a set, you know, coming into the office for a set number of hours and, and uh, I'm there for the job. And, and that's fine. Like th those are two wonderfully um, valuable ends of the spectrum. Um, I think when you're a fast growing organization solving huge problems and you know that you're going to need to be remote, then you really need that self-driven individual much more than you did in a workplace environment. Um, so who you're looking for and the types of things you're assessing during the interview process absolutely need to change. Um, the, the next is around communication. Like my team will constantly uh, complain about how I rail on different, um, not to call any out, but messaging platforms uh, that we all use at work. Um, and in, in many ways, those are like remarkably bad channels to actually have thought. They're great for super tiny, like, hey, did you do this? Um, but if you're going back and forth and trying to actually have a conversation uh, via these, these messaging platforms, it's wildly inefficient. Uh, human beings, I myself, like when I see one of these messages come across, I think about it as a to-do list. It's like, oh, I've got this task. My response may be quite perfunctory. <laughs> Uh, uh, requiring a follow-up question. So something that could have been accomplished in a three-minute conversation could potentially span a day, a day and a half as we're going back and forth. Um, so I think it's re-emphasizing and helping people understand when does it make sense to pick up the phone, having the expectation, if you're not in the meeting, you're picking up that call um, so that everybody can communicate in a much more efficient channel via the uh, whatever channel is most appropriate given the type of communication they need to convey or the type of response that they need in return. Yeah, Brittany? Yeah, so I, I agree with that. And one of the things that we have um, done here at The Block is we set communication standards for how we use our internal tooling. So primarily that's Slack, email, our content uh, management platform, and meetings. And so we've clarified what our expectations are for each of those. Um, in an effort to cut down on some of those communications in our remote environment. I think if you do the quickest Google search on pros and cons of remote um, first work, then communication will be on there every single time. So we really leaned into that. We knew that was going to be a challenge when we um, went to remote first, uh, I think in October of last year is when we announced that we were going to do that formally. Um, and we spent months getting that right and making sure that we had the buy-in from all the different teams so that it was something that we could really um, hold as our gold standard. Um, but I think there's always going to be work to do there. You know, we are a global company. We have people in all over the world. And I think we're, so now we're kind of dealing with what our standards are as a global company. Um, you know, this is an environment where there's someone online at any given time, you will get messages on off hours on weekends. And so we're working right now on aligning how we communicate out what we expect or what we don't expect um, in those situations. So I think, you know, 
people just want clarity. Companies just want clarity. They want to know what's expected of them. Um, they're going to look to the leadership team to set those standards, um, but they want the, the guesswork taken out of how to be an effective remote employee. Um, and then one other kind of caveat to remote work that I'll just add is I think you have to be really thoughtful about understanding your culture and what your team wants out of a remote environment. Um, mm -hmm. At least for us at The Block, we have different teams that are kind of looking for different levels of socialization. And so for some of our teams, having some sort of like semi-monthly all-hands bonding um, is enough. Um, for others, they want actual like carve-out time for non-work bonding. And I think you just have to meet people where they are um, and also offer opportunities to a variety of different people, knowing some people are going to be interested in this and other people are not. Um, and not get, you know, um, from a people perspective, it's easy for us to be like, well, why aren't people attending these events? Um, and so we try to offer, you know, monthly company wide events, we encourage team leaders to schedule events that fit their kind of individuals teams needs and wants. Um, and then we also have a way that we can um, have our employees get to know each other more on a one on one basis. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, this is something that we're going to be experimenting with probably until the end of time, um, just on what works and what people are actually utilizing and, and how we create that engagement, recognizing that not everybody is seeking that in the way that, um, that we may be. Ooh, Brittany, uh, what, what, what's one of the things you guys ended up doing, um, when you moved to remote first that like the employees loved that just kind of surprised you and the team? So honestly, I would say it's been most of our like learning and development um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, we've tried to, to grassroots a lot of our events. We did like a, um, we did an event where everybody would submit like this view of their work from home space. So like you're mm -hmm. seeing this view all the time, but we submitted this view and then we all guessed like based on personalities and what we know whose was whose. And yeah. that was like, like we went way over time on that. People loved that, had like a lot of opinions on that. Um, but we have, we have probably... 40 to 50% of our company, and again, we're global, so we have time zones all over the place, mm -hmm. um, attend our op, our like opt-in trainings. And mm -hmm. so, you know, in kind of Q2, we realized we were getting relatively good attendance for that, all things considered. And so we're leaning into that in Q3 on um, creating more of like an internal task force and trying to figure out like how we can make those trainings even better so that more and more people want to utilize that. Mm -hmm. um, there's always some level of socialization there, but it's not you know, we have we, we have this term internally called forced fun and some people love forced fun and some people hate forced fun <laughs> so this is kind of a way for people to get together but also learn something and not spend 30 minutes like chit chatting with each other um because that's just not for everyone yeah Brittany did also didn't mention that we we do like a little jam session at the end of our all hands where we just kind of just play out like a bunch of jams every week and then we can kind of poke fun at each other for our choices, but um, that, we'll move on yeah, to opt Rob. Opt-in activity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but there's, I think it's important to, to have, you know, on the one side, the company culture, on the other side, the education resources that are available for people to either want to learn more about the company, want to learn more about crypto, want to find more uh, specific information, maybe about some facets of this industry. So um, Rob, yeah. how, are you, Dean, how are you seeing? Sorry, no. one more thing on that, Dean, because I think that's a really good point is, mm -hmm. um, and, and we talk about this a lot um, on my people team, but culture is, doesn't have to be designed around all of these really big events. Like the, the back and forth that we have on our um, chief of staff's song choice um, leading into our all hands in the um, Zoom chat, like that's culture. That's, that's, mm -hmm. what people, um, that's what people think about when they think about what it's like to work at the block. They don't really think about these big um, events that we hold maybe every so often, but, um, but I think it's so important in remote first to find those little kind of like rituals that exist in your company that aren't big productions, but they're just part of the um, DNA of, of who you are. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Rob. I'll pass it back. To you. No, no, um, no. That was great, I, and it's good, good for me to listen to too. Um, I think one of the big things is is just being very clear too, as a company, of like what you are. Like, are you remote first? Are you hybrid? Are you bringing people into the office? And once you make that decision, like stick with it, because one of the things that I, one of my, one of my thoughts is that employees are going to very much start self selecting out of opportunities based upon whether it's remote or whether it's not especially if they have some element of career experience, maybe not for, maybe not as much for a recent college grad, but if you've been working remote for a while for myself, I've been working remote now for three years. I'm never going back into an office. It's not going to happen. I 
somebody ever wants to force me to, I'm going to say, no, no, thanks. Bye. Um, so it's just, it's not going to happen. And I think a lot of other people are kind of in that boat where they either know they want to be in the office or they, they know they don't. And so kind of gets to the importance of the interview process and just being very clear about what those expectations are for people. Because like David said, um, you're looking for people with sometimes different traits than you might be if you are having somebody in office. I think it's it's a lot harder to train individual or at least entry level individuals when you're talking about um, remote roles. It's a lot harder to build the the company culture and, and you have to be very intentional about it in a way that, that Brittany had mentioned. And I think like all of those things kind of go into that interview process and making sure the type of person that you you are looking for um, there's, they, they just know exactly what you're expecting so that you can find that individual. You can kind of self-select that individual who is um, really dedicated to, to that style of work versus somebody who thinks that they know what they're getting into and, and you kind of paint a, uh, an inappropriate picture for them and they start and they, they don't really like it because of, of kind of how you maybe represented the opportunity in the, in the interviews. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. The way that you guys uh, represent certain opportunities and then the actual opportunity that they come into, right? There has to be alignment on that. So before we move on to uh, some questions from our audience here, I'll just ask a little bit uh, broadly, what's, what are some resources for people leaders that are working in the blockchain and broad crypto space? And, and how do you recommend them? What do you, how do you find them? Um, maybe what's top of mind when you are recommending resources to people, what are some things that you turn to? David? Yeah. Um, so for me, the most important thing is to know what's out there, what other people are doing. Uh, and so like, I'm a sucker for a good old fashioned white paper. Uh, don't get me wrong. Like I, 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 we, we uh, read them voraciously, really understand kind of what, for, for all of the new things that people are working on, what, what, what are the technological innovations? What are the potential use cases? Uh, and then just diving deep uh, to understand the, the extent to which those use cases are actually in development and being applied. Um, so, I, so I think that's one huge, most important thing. And, and I definitely encourage our, our, our team to really um, have a deep understanding of what's happening in the space. Um, apart from just being like, at least for me, intellectually interesting, um, it really mm -hmm. helps you stay abreast of everything that's going on. Um, and so uh, I think the white papers and then, and then there are uh, obviously um, a number of different uh, great uh, sources on um, to quickly digest uh, what's happening, whether it's um, taking the super uh, uh, fun jaunt down the geeky corners of YouTube on technical folks that are actually really talking about the technical aspects of the project. I, I think for me, that's a huge resource that benefits everybody from HR to um, uh, the, the engineering team. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, not to show you guys, but um, I think <laughs> you have a pretty good newsletter for like $25 or $50 a month. I forget how much it costs, but there's um, just like some high level stuff that I think you can really glean from understanding the industry um, as a whole. Obviously, it's not really HR people specific, but I think it does tend. I, I don't think that there's necessarily a ton of like very people specific and crypto specific news in one. Um, that said, like, I know the block covers hiring trends. So there's usually like a monthly roundup on uh, exec hirings and, and people have moved on, things like that. You get to see funding announcements. Um, you get to see when there are layoffs or anything of that nature. So I think that the crypto specific uh, type of, of news, whether it's the block, Masari, Coindesk, any of those types of places, those are always good to just know what's happening as an industry. And then I would say kind of your standard uh, maybe HR or people related publications that that you like to follow and kind of keeping abreast at, of, of both sources of information in a side by side way, because I, I think in a lot of cases, there's not always the mo most crossover between the two. Yeah, let's let's give that plug, Rob, while we're here. So <laughs> what are some of those those newsletters or, or resources uh, by name that you recommend? Um so I, I mean, one that Besides I, I the block, at, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if it's, if it's HR people related, I, I follow, at least for me, like staffing industry analysts is, is a recruiting industry focused one in particular, but covers a lot of, I would say people related trends for me. I, I'm not as much on the internal HR side of the house. So Brittany probably has some better recommendations as far as, as that side of the house goes. I, I, for me personally, I mostly follow kind of 
recruiting industry related publications on that end. Brittany, yeah. we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, there are two I can recommend. So one of them is called Amplify, um, and it is a relatively small kind of like VP, CPO um, level group. Um, and, and generally, like my, my strategy there is to try to find somebody else who's in a similar growth stage or also in a crypto company and bounce ideas off of that person. Like that's that's been where I've had the most success rather than just um, kind of perusing the, the boards there. Um, and there's another one called um, Noetic that is that is a CPO group as well. They're a data um, analytic, people data analytics dashboard, um, but they have a really good community that um, that people could join. Um, and then I'll just say, like, we have a we have a big culture of sharing um, at, at the block. So on my team, we all of us read a lot of articles. We send them. We highlight things that are relevant. Um, and I think kind of creating that um, environment on your teams will um, uh, is very beneficial to everybody. Yeah, I think creating access for that, like across the company, across departments, so people can kind of intershare resources is a really important thing, too. So we're going to go ahead and turn over to our questions before we close out here. But um, the first question is for Rob. So this comes from Lee Candiotti. I hope I'm saying that correctly. So Rob, um, they ask, are you a solo operator as a recruiter in the blockchain vertical? Or, or do you have a group, large or small, of recruiters that work for you in the blockchain crypto space specifically? Yeah, I started off as a solo operator, but now have a team of eight uh, full-time recruiters that work with me. So based throughout the US, we're a remote first team. So have uh, recruiters everywhere from Michigan and Nebraska to New York and Philly. So um, yeah, we're, we're a team of, of nine people. Got it. I'm just curious, is this, was this growth mostly over the last uh, couple of years, last year, last couple of months? How it started positions? slowly in, in 2020 and kind of have, have picked up hiring as, as time has gone. Got it. Got it. So we're going to go to the next question for David, um, which was in regards to the white papers that you brought up. So, uh, I mean, I like reading white papers. and I know that for a lot of those who might be, um, you know, maybe more uh, recently uh, looking to get into the nitty gritty of the, the tech side of crypto or, you know, have been in crypto are, are very used to doing that. But David, can you just explain like maybe first off what the what, what a white paper is for maybe those who might be unfamiliar and then yeah what are some of those that you recommend yeah so so um and i've been seeing a shift recently towards especially earlier stage projects having maybe less formal white papers and and uh more discussions but but at, at its yeah. core the, the the goal of the white paper really should be to uh describe um the technology behind what they're creating and, and for me a great white paper does a really succinct job um, being very explicit about what are the novel technological developments that are actually, that, that they're uh, going to introduce as they're developing um, their, their project. Um, the second part, usually there should be a thoughtful discussion over the potential use cases that they imagine today. Um, and then uh, often there, there should also be a pretty thoughtful discussion of the overall tokenomics of how the, um, uh, what the economics are of, of, of the token. Uh, and how does that change through time based on usage, et cetera? Um, and, and that's a, the, a great place to start. Um, I think there, uh, then the next thing is like, okay, so you read it. Now, what does this actually mean? Uh, and in order to really understand kind of what, what does it actually mean? That's where looking at the ecosystem of, of a protocol is pretty eye-opening, uh, right? Uh, so you can see whether it's Solana, like, Who's using it? How are they using it? Why are they using it? What's the adoption for the applications that are actually being built? And that really starts to give you ideas of how powerful something could actually be, uh, whether it's uh, something like Solana, AVAX, Polkadot, or uh, uh, something like Ar Arweave. Um, so, and then the best place to get it is actually just go to the project, the, their website. Uh, usually, it's a, it, uh, a, or, or if they have one, the foundation. Um, and then you download the white paper, start start geeking out. Um, I also encourage you to, to create your own network of folks that you can talk to about this. Like, look, uh, it's, I call it like, create your own little book club um, or find one that already exists where, where you're going through that. And, and for us, it's, uh, you, know, you know, reviewing the white papers is one part of that, but then also reading analyses that other people have on different protocols, whether it's in the academic literature space, there's a ton of academic literature uh, mm. that has just blown up over the last two years, uh, looking at different aspect, aspect, aspects of blockchain, whether it's on the 
um, game theory side, on the traditional financial modeling side, et cetera. Um, so spotlighting actually, just to add on to that question, spotlighting kind of outside of maybe just crypto focused companies, right? So some of those mm -hmm. ancillary companies developing a crypto department or a crypto focused mm -hmm. product of some kind, right? Um, they might not necessarily publish uh, a white paper, uh, but are, are you maybe seeing that on their end or are you, how do you advise people to look at maybe some of their resources, some of the way that they're developing products? Yeah, so for, for big companies doing it, look, uh, look at what's on their LinkedIn, who they're hiring for, I think it's a great place to, to start. Um, and, and as I mentioned, some of the largest uh, recruiters of blockchain talent over the last year really have been um, in large traditional companies. Um, I think in, in, to get a sense of um, what large organizations are actually doing, um, uh, Deloitte and Accenture uh, provide State of the Union reports. Um, they don't specifically uh, say what people are doing, but, but can give you a pretty good idea of what types of applications they're seeing in their practices. Um, and, and then lastly, the uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance um, has a lot of actual real world examples of things that people have been doing on, on, uh, on Ethereum, um, both those in development and, the, and those are, that are expected uh, going forward. Other than that, it's just like, uh, you know, saw a company uh, and, and started just Googling, okay, Lockheed blockchain, <laughs> what do I find? And, and go for those that you, are, you expect or should be utilizing it and just see what sort of press releases um, they have. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great answer for, for where to find some of those maybe resources of where to start and start exploring on you know, how involved these companies are. So we're gonna have um, one more kind of question toss to the group. And so this goes back to some of the hiring trends that you're observing maybe in the other verticals in the industry. Um, looking to apply blockchain solutions. So so maybe what are you seeing in terms of maybe future hiring activity of this, right? David answered it a little bit in terms of some of the growth that, he, the growth that he's observing. Um, but uh, what are you guys seeing on your end? Let's start with maybe Brittany here. Yeah, so I am not probably the the most tied into this one. Um, we are, but I will say that we are hiring people. Like when we're interviewing people, some of the other companies that they're interviewing with has been has been kind of surprising, um, mm. which goes back to what David has said. Like you know, these big companies that are looking to build this out and and apply this as a long term part of their strategy. Um, so so we're definitely seeing some of it more so I would say over the course of the last six months than than ever before too. Um, used to we'd be interviewing somebody who was interviewing with three similar sized crypto companies, and now um, I would I, I think I've seen that shift. Got it, Rob. Yeah, I, I'll take this one less from like the the hiring trend perspective and maybe more just from the candidate side. If like I see identity, healthcare, real estate, news, supply chain, if, if any of those are if you're a job seeker and that's something of interest for you, be it you, know, you work in real estate now, you also like blockchain and, and, and those two things are interesting to you. I would try and dive as deep down those specific. I, I've always kind of talked about them as like subsectors of the industry. Like I would try and figure out what is really interesting to you because if you can become an expert or even just smarter than most people when it comes to one of those uh, types of, of things, you become incredibly attractive to a company that might be building in that space. And mm. I think being a having some type of specific skill set versus being just a very broad generalist in, in the blockchain and crypto ecosystem I think that is really advantageous to you as a candidate. So if you're asking that question from the standpoint of you know, which one of these is a good place to work, I think whatever one interests you the most is is the best place for you to work, to be honest. David? Yeah, so um, you, you know, we, we really began to see this trend last year uh, where it was the, the, the folks that had the most job postings for blockchain talent, whether that's a product person, an engineer, t were the top eight were non-crypto companies. It literally was like IBM, Deloitte & Touche, Ericsson Mobile, Johnson & Johnson. Um, and the, 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 many of these are, are large Fortune 500 companies. Um, and I, my suspicion is that that uh, put, could potentially accelerate as we go into this down market because those organizations do have much larger war chests. They have businesses uh, where current revenue is completely independent of crypto prices. Um, and they're, the, the CTOs and engineers in those teams are really beginning to, to see the impact that blockchain could have um, in, in their respective industries. I, I think um, 
you know, financial services certainly seem to get this earlier than other industries. I, I remember, uh, you, know, you know, two years ago, uh, went, went to the Bitcoin uh, conference. It, it felt like, I don't know, three out of four people I talked to were straight out of Goldman, BlackRock, JP Morgan, J and they were looking to make that transition um, because they had begun to see whether it's on um, obscure corners of the financial services market that nobody ever knows about, but that are important, like the custodial layer, uh, uh, the ATS layer, like there are so many layers of financial services stack um, that are uh, have the potential to be profoundly impacted, and people are already working on it. Um, that that they seem to embrace it first, but but now we're just seeing it broadly. And when we look forward to the types of applications that are going to be developed, I, I mean, a lot of it now is around what's well, leveraging these layer one, layer two to to solve real world applications or real world problems with applications, and that's everything from supply chain management to agriculture. Uh, to uh, transportation, um, enter entertainment. Um, and, and so I, I think that's really what we're going to see more and more of um, large companies adopting that, reapplying it um, in, in their industries. And, and they got the cash to grow and develop in, in these products during this downturn in a way that many earlier stage tech companies might not. Yep, the future is certainly bright. Well, I want to thank our guests for the opportunity to have them here on the webinar with us today. We have uh, Brittany, VP of People here at The Block, Rob Payone, founder of Proof of Talent, and David Ramirez. Thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today and for the work you're doing to onboard, assuage, and help those coming into crypto, whether that's moving it into uh, crypto for the first time, hoping to find a new career in this industry, or moving into a new or different role. I'm sure this is going to be changing quite a lot and uh, it'll be interesting to see what this looks like in due time thanks very much for everybody who listened to us today thank you very much for all your questions we'll see you again soon thank you thank you thanks dan